repeat clients similar to what we have here in Weathersfield. Uh, from in addition to doing executive recruitment, our firm is really a full service local government firm. So we're involved in recruiting. Uh, we're also involved in interim placements for city managers, department head positions, those that communities are looking for someone that is 30, 60, 90 days to, to fill a role to keep the wheels on the wagon as a recruitment may take place. Uh, we also do embedded services. Some smaller communities don't have the need for a full-time person, but they want uh, maybe a part-time person in the HR operation for three days a week or something of that nature. Um, we train an awful lot of local government leaders uh, and from soup to nuts, either in person or on online, a lot more online because of COVID of recent, but we train about a thousand government employees over the course of a month. And those are from supervisory training, to EEOC training, to promotional opportunities, assessment centers, you, you name it, we've, we probably are involved in some level or shape of training. Um, we also hold a lot of our own state and national conferences and regional conferences uh, dealing with local government matters and issues with uh, top flight speakers and programs. Uh, and then we also do a lot of other analysis, fee studies, programs, elements, restructuring programs, um, class and comp type studies, things of that nature. So we, I, I say that in the sense that we're involved in a lot of different activities. Uh, the principal of the firm, Ron Holifield, um, is a former city manager, as is as my, and so he speaks pretty regularly at state and national conferences. He's about every two or three weeks at a state or national conference. I'm about once a month somewhere speaking about trends in management and best management practices. So uh, I say that in the sense that we understand local government and we understand the dynamics of what it takes to run a community in today's day and age and all the challenges that take place with that. Uh, from a personal standpoint, uh, I bring about 35 years of city management experience in communities in Maryland, Michigan, and Florida. And uh, probably the best example of why, uh, why I think SGR is really good at what we did. I, I hired them to assist me as a former city manager in my last community to help recruitment for several different department heads that are retiring or moving on to other opportunities. And uh, the principal of the firm and I kind of clicked and hit it off and his style and mine were pretty similar. So we basically uh, decided to, uh, to move into a situation where I officially retired and then joined SGR on a full-time basis to do the work that I'm now doing. Um, so that's a little bit of my, my background. I want to introduce Larry Boyd. Uh, Larry and I work together uh, on a lot of searches, especially in the law enforcement arena. So Larry, I'm going to let you kind of introduce yourself and your background, and then you can kick it back to me and we'll talk about uh, the, the, the purpose of the meeting this evening. But I want to make sure everybody understood who we were and what we bring to the table in this process. Absolutely. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Boyd, and uh, it's good to join you. I'm not actually on site. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you from Texas right now. I was just sharing with uh, Gary and Doug. Interestingly, I checked and found out it's about 10 degrees cooler where I am than it whereas you are, and that's probably very unusual for that to occur, and I'm sure it won't last, but I'll enjoy it while it does. Um, I'm, I'm a retired police chief. I, I, uh, I came th through the ranks with Arlington, Texas, and spent then 12 years as the police chief in Irving, Texas. Um, Irving is, uh, is uh, adjacent to Dallas. Uh, just it, probably, it might not help to mention this, but Irving is where the Dallas Cowboys used to play. And some, I have to be careful in other states mentioning that the Cowboys played there, but it might help you to understand a little more about where, where Irving was. I did that for 12 years, absolutely loved it, but felt like it was time to step off and let somebody else take over the organization. After 12 years, you probably start to get blinders and things. Uh, but recognize the the value of policing and have seen through the years uh, the impact when a police chief connects with the community, connects with the department, connects with the other team members within the city and how well that works. And I've also seen when there is a bad connection and how difficult that is. And of course, you know, we're in very challenging times. So this is a critical uh, decision that your city manager and that you uh, need to make. So uh, I, it's it's my it's sort of my therapy now. Uh, you don't just step off of policing. As Doug knows, you don't just step out of city management and 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 uh, not do anything. And so it's my uh, I enjoy helping cities find that connection. So it's uh, my honor and, and uh, privilege to to help you out. So I will uh, turn it back over to Doug and we can get started listening to you. Great. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate that. So um, as Gary had mentioned, uh, I'm in town for the next couple of days. Uh, we got here yesterday and I've been meeting with a variety of, of department personnel and city personnel and elected officials. And obviously we've got an outreach tonight to the community as a whole. 
And, and for us to do our job well as, as recruiters for the community, it's really important for us to get a holistic view of what's going on in terms of the operations and the dynamics and the challenges and the, the, uh, just the sense of, of what, uh, what's happening here in your community. As I said, I've got a pretty good feel from uh, being involved in the, the former town manager uh, executive recruitment about kind of how you're structured and size of your budget and the nature. Obviously, I've been getting brought up to speed since that's been a couple of years, but it's, it's great to be back here. But what we really are doing in these next several days and the effort we have this evening is to get a sense. These are very public positions, town manager position, certainly as a, as a chief of police position is a very public position, high profile in a community. And what we try to bring to the table as part of recruiters is to get a feel from both internal to the organization as well as external to the organization about desires, interest, and, and just issues that whoever is selected as your successor chief of police is likely going to have to get their arms around uh, on day one as well as over the next probably three to five years in the position. Um, and so what we try to do is develop a position profile brochure to help market the position of the police chief opportunity. And so in that, we'll talk about the community as a whole. We'll talk about the organizational structure and the size and the services provided by the town. And then we're going to drill in deeper about the department, the police department in particular. So we'll talk about the table of organization, how you're structured, the services you're providing, the type of budget you're involved with, any of the special teams and, and programs that, the, and that are provided, relationships to school systems and things of that nature, SRO, DARE, DARE officers, things of that nature. So we can provide kind of a snapshot of that. And then after that, um, we really are starting to reach out to get a sense of, all right, what are those issues and opportunities that the next chief's going to deal with? And then we also want to get a sense of because of the nature of this position, you know, what are if you could paint the picture of the ideal police chief, what does that look like to you? And so these are fairly open ended questions that we're trying to capture. And as you can envision, as we're having all these meetings internal and external and with elected officials and community individuals, it's like a word cloud. The more often we hear the same sorts of things, the bigger the font, the more likely that's going to end up in a brochure that we'll use to help market and explain the position. And it's really important for us to get a holistic viewpoint of this because we want our candidates that are going to be thinking about this opportunity to use the brochure as their lens, if you will, to say, am I a good fit for this position and for this community? So we really want to talk about those things that are critical that your next chief is going to be facing or that the community or the administration or the elected officials are expecting the next chief to, to get their arms around and address in some way, shape or form. And that's by no means saying everything's perfect now or everything's wrong now. It really is a sense of it really doesn't matter. It's where we are as a point in time as an organization and what you want the next chief to be involved with. So with that as a backdrop, uh, I will say that the challenges of hiring, Larry mentioned as well, the challenges of hiring a police chief are very, very unique in today's day and age. I don't think anyone, if they've been following the news in the last 12 months in particular, it has changed dramatically, especially in the last year. But increasingly, the position of a police chief is a very, very high profile, high politically charged type position because of the nature of the work that they're involved with as well. And so as a result of that, when Gary and I spoke about this outreach, we suggested that it'd be a great idea to hold a forum like this. Sometimes we do this in person, sometimes hybrid. And then we're also going to talk about a survey that we're going to be working with uh, Gary and the team here that allows some additional feedback from folks that may not be able to participate this evening. So with that as a preface, um, I'm going to serve as moderator, but Gary's going to be kind of the, uh, the man behind the curtain in terms of managing who's on the call and letting them unmute and things of that nature so that we can be focused on your responses. But um, in no particular order, I'll let, you know, I don't know how, how uh, if it's a first call or anything else, but let's start with a question of if, if you were to, if I'm asking the community, what are the top several issues? And let's just start with the top three issues that you think that are most important for the next police chief to deal with, uh, let's open an ad up for a conversation. So the top three issues, and then we'll talk about the other issues as we go deeper. So you have a chance if you wanna be involved in a couple of different comments, but initially let's talk with the top, top three issues involved. So Gary, if you wanna let the first caller in and we'll go from there. Yep. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna treat this similar to how we do town council meetings. Um, I will call out a, um, I will call out either a name as I see it on the screen or a phone number um, because we do have a mix of callers and individuals on video. Um, so I will, if I see a name, I'll call it a name. I'll do my best to alternate because people who have uh, are on video actually are show up first in the screen list. 
Um, so I'll do my best to alternate here or there between the two. Um, and so the first person that's in the list is, and I'm, I apologize if I don't get the name right, Melissa Katulski, if you'd like to answer the question, uh, which is the other, just quickly, um, you, everyone is on mute. If you're a caller, you have to press star six to unmute yourself. Um, and um, otherwise I will try to do my best to hit the button here to try to unlock you on this end. Um, and if you do not wish to speak, um, you don't have to say anything. I'll call your name or your phone number multiple times, which will give you the opportunity to unmute yourself and, and get on. Um, okay. Get on. So go ahead, Melissa. Hi. Um, thank you for everybody for being here. I'm so um, proud to see that the community coming together to do something like this. Um, I think that a couple of a type, I didn't expect to be called in the spot, but I figured I may as well contribute with from my background. Um, I think that some of the things that I've observed in our communities that have gone well through the years is, I think, really good emergency responders. Um, and I think that's something that, um, you know, uh, uh, in terms of not just um, for police, but police, fire, everything. Um, um, and then I think... Um, uh, just uh, responding also to ensuring that roadside um, traffic goes smoothly when there's construction. Um, and I think uh, bigger issues would just be just to work with community policing and reaching out to the community and ensuring that, um, that there's a positive engagement with the, the, um, the citizens of the town and those that visit as well. Right. Thank you. Okay. And next we have 860-997-5619. Good evening. My name is Barbara Rue. I live at 79 Main Street. Um, this may not seem really important, but I think if we get a new chief, I would like to see someone, if they have a motorcycle, wear a helmet. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Mark Catania. Mark? Okay, move on to the next caller. 860-930-7328. Remember, if you're on a phone, you have to press star six in order to unmute. 860-930-7328. Rachel Bard. Okay. Next caller, 860-712-2647. Eight six zero seven one two two six four seven. I realize I didn't ask twice, so I will go back to Rachel. Maybe it's Baird, if you wish to speak. Next caller, 860-616-8629. 
29. Okay, area code 201. Oh, hold on, gotta go this way. Adamovian. Adamovian. Okay, two zero one. Sorry, two zero one, two seven four, six one seven four. Hey Gary, this is Mike Rell. You may just want to remind folks to hit star six if they are looking to speak. Some of the folks may just be listening in. Um, as casual observers on this. Yep. So again, star six. So if I had called your phone number already and you wanted to talk and you didn't hit star six, hit it now, I, I'll be able to see it. And then we'll just pick on you one at a time. Okay. I'll just call out that number again. It's 201-274-6174. Uh, Deputy Mayor Tom Mazzarella. Deputy Mayor Mazzarella. Just listening. All right. Uh, 860-202-3693. Eight six zero two zero two three six nine three. Mayor Michael Rell. I don't know if you're just observing. I can actually put my video back on. Thank you, uh, Gary, and thank you, Doug. Good to see you again. It's been a couple of years. Um, oh. Wearing a different hat than the last time I I sat around that conference table with you. you know, a couple of years ago, but um, just wanted to say thank you for uh, for not only being part of this uh, search committee and also for uh, those on the call tonight, um, either weighing in on um, you know their their concerns or their input to the municipality on what they want to see in their next chief, but uh, also to those that you know may be trying to gain some insight into what uh, we are looking for for a police chief. Um, in the next police chief that we intend to hire, um, you know, in the, in the shortcoming months. Uh, again, thank you for, for being part of this. Um, you know, I, I think you and I are going to sit down uh, together with Gary, and I know you're meeting with some of the um, council members as well. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I also appreciate you meeting with the department heads and I believe maybe some um, of our police force right now. So it's always good to get a broad scope of, um, you know, opinions out there. And, you know, we appreciate that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty big shoes to fill. And uh, I think uh, we've got uh, the right team to be able to do it. So appreciate it, Doug. Great. Thank you, Michael. I've enjoyed working with you in the past and obviously going forward as well. So yeah, absolutely. Great. I did know, notice uh, that uh, 860-202-3693 had unmuted, and I didn't know if you wanted to add comment. 860-202-3693. Gary, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, this is Anthony Ignati, the town fire marshal, just listening in. Um, just trying to get a feel of what, what the public wants or the ideas out there. And so I'm just uh, really monitoring. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I think that's it for video. Now continuing phone numbers, 860-614-0752. Area code 860-614-0759.
Hello, I don't know if we're supposed to say our names first, but um, this is Rob O'Connor. I was just going to listen in, but um, <clears throat> I thank you guys for doing a smart thing. Um, as a former executive recruiter, I think it's a good idea to throw out a wide net. Um, I would say on the premise of this being a highly political charged position, that I would hope that you'd look for somebody that was not looking at it from a political lens and I'd hope that you look for a chief um, that would take the protect and serve equal protection under the law as the as the main thing, and to to try to not look at it this as a political job. Um, heavy emphasis on the serving part. I hope that the the chief would come in and um, bring that message to the police department in general to to that we're you know to serve the community in all the in all the ways the community wants them to serve and not the um, overseers. And also, um, I saw on the, the police department Facebook page today had a, a post about, um, I think it was called 30 for 30, with an emphasis on women and policing. And I hope that the, the recruiting process would turn up some strong female women chief candidates for the town. I think that would be a good thing. Um, a, a good balance to the way things have been the years I've lived here, at least. So, thanks again. Thank, thank you, Rob. I, I can maybe react to both of those statements as well. Appreciate the the comment. And I, by by political, I meant that that the sense is it's a um, it's a very very highly visible position. I know Larry can speak to this as well. Um, what I can tell you nationally is that, for an example, um, uh, the average tenure of a city manager, town manager, nationally is about five to seven years. Uh, politics change, councils come and go, directions of communities come and go. Police chiefs used to have a longer tenure, um, but now we're also seeing that five to seven year type window be kind of a, a, a scenario that we're seeing in turnover in police chief positions as well. Now, for every for that to be the national average, that means there's obviously folks that are staying a whole lot longer and folks that are staying a whole lot less as well <laughs> by the nature of getting the national average. So that's what I was kind of getting at, the sense that um, it's, it's just a challenging operating environment in which to recruit for a police chief. Um, and as I say, uh, if you look over the past 12 months in particular, uh, a lot of folks are, are saying it's time to, to move on. Um, and it's a, an opportunity for, you know, an, for folks to do they want to become a police chief. Now, that being said, you also raised an interesting comment about the, uh, the woman and, and police chiefs. Um, actually, the most underrepresented demographic in the police chief capacity, at least it was a few years ago, I don't know that it has changed dramatically, uh, was women chiefs. Um, regardless of, of, um, of the ethnic background, the, uh, the fewer, the, the, the least represented demographic, if you will, was a female police chief. So I appreciate your comment uh, to that effect. Both Larry and I have worked on a number of police chief searches together. Uh, we've always cast a very wide net to try to encourage a very diverse pool. Uh, and then at that point, as they go through, we'll talk a little bit later in the call about got, what the recruitment process starts to look and feel like and the steps that we take. So you get an understanding of that. Um, but your comment is very well taken. And it's certainly our desire to try to cast as broad of a net as possible to try to provide a very diverse pool of candidates for which the town uh, could consider from. So thank you for your comment. Thank you. Okay, 860-965. Three nine two three. 960 965 3923. Again, we need to press star six. Just checking. We have someone who just looked to join the group. If you can just give me one second. Okay, Doug, I don't know if you're able to re uh, just kind of re ask the question just because someone else just joined the oh, group. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, what we're looking for, at least in the first segment of tonight's meeting, is from the community's perspective, what are the top three issues that they believe um, the next, your successor chief of police will be facing? 
uh, both on day one, as well as probably looking out a good three to five years uh, in terms of the identifying those, what we call challenges and opportunities. And the reason we ask that is because we want the individuals that are considering this position when they're, they're looking over the recruitment brochure that we're talking about developing this evening, um, that that's the lens in which they evaluate their background skills and interests and abilities and saying, yes, I'm a good fit for that. And this is the type of work I've done in other communities or other responsibilities I've had in other departments that we think is applicable there. So it really is a sense for candidates to consider, is this the right, the right job? Uh, so with that, that's kind of the background. Initially, we'll, we'll have some subsequent questions to go forward with as well, but we're going to start on the challenges and opportunities. Okay. And... And actually, um, just so the new caller who just turned on her screen, so you know um, if you'd like to speak or add anything to the question that Mr. Thomas just added, or sorry, respond to the question that uh, Mr. Thomas just mentioned, uh, now would be a good time. So I'm gonna call on Deb Cohen because I think I've made it through all the phone numbers at this point. Um, sorry to be late to the call. Um, I'm just listening right now, but thank you. All right, that was... That was it for that question, Doug. Okay. I don't see anyone. If I missed anyone, please feel free to press star six and unmute now or unmute yourself. And I apologize if I, uh, if I missed you. Okay. All right. And if, if there's a caller that comes in that wants to go back to that other topic, we can certainly pick that up on the fly as well. Um, well, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about um, the ideal attributes of your successor chief. And so, um, what I'm going to ask the community, I'm going to give you kind of the magic wand that you could wave. And if you could create the perfect chief in your mind in terms of what that person brings to the table in terms of their background, their experience, their style, their comfort in dealing with community issues, whatever that may look and feel like to you, um, what I'm looking for is to capture a series of attributes um, that you think are going to be critical uh, for a chief to be successful here in Weathersfield. And as I say, that can be academic, it can be experiential, it can be personal style, communication styles, whatever that looks and feels like is really kind of a wide open question. But so what are those adjectives and, and descriptors that you would have if you were painting the picture of the ideal successor police chief here in Weathersfield, Connecticut? So I'll open that up and Gary, I'll let you manage those calls as they come forward. Okay. So, um, and I forgot people, there's a raise your hand function too. And I just saw Deb raise her hand. So I'll <laughs> let her go. And then I'll, <laughs> the screen shifted when someone added. So I'm going to do my best to kind of keep everyone in here, but go ahead, Deb. Okay, I'll be quick. In answer to your, to your last questionable to all residents of Weathersfield, um, uh, I don't know what more I can add to that. Okay. My past experience has been that we did not have an accessible chief. Yes, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. And alternating back to phone numbers, 860-997-75-619. Yep, you got it. Go ahead, Barbara. I saw you unmuted. Oh. Yes. Um, I can't get in on Zoom. That's why I'm on the phone. I think it would be important for a police chief to be very patient, to be calm, to be practical. And I think that one of the things that has been helped, I think about the last chiefs we've had, they've all come up through the ranks in Weathersfield. And I think that it's going to be important for a new chief to meet as many people in the community as possible so that the people in the community feel comfortable reaching out. Excellent. Okay. So by very nature, very, very public outward facing uh, personality and comfort and kind of being part of the fabric of the community. Absolutely. Because it's a great town. I mean, it, it, it's a very diverse town. It's a town that pulls together when there's a problem. Um, it's, it's really a terrific place. And a lot of people have lived here most of their lives. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That was also going to be a challenge. Excellent. Okay, uh, Melissa Kotulski. Um, I think that uh, 
it's been my experience in other jurisdictions to engage with police chiefs that have um, responded positively to um, to email correspondence and and uh, just general correspondence of that nature. Um, I think that that's a really good think attribute to have encountered. It, it makes you feel that um, what you have to say is valued um, and that it's not necessarily um, to um, demoralize you or anything. It's just a matter of, of um, uh, giving a sense of, of um, engaging with the community. So um, I think that, that that has been very positive in, in my experience in other jurisdictions. So I feel like that would be something nice to, to, to see us evolve into that next stage. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Mark Catania. Catania. Okay. 860-712-2647. 860-712-2647. Rachel Baird. Rachel Baird. Eight six zero six one six eight six two nine. Eight six zero six one six eight six two nine. Christine Lacella. And Christine Lacella. Okay, 201 274 6174. Area code 201. Two seven four six one seven four. Edward Peruda. Ed Peruda. Eight six zero two zero two three six nine three. Again, for everyone on the phone, if you press star six to unmute yourself, eight six zero two zero two three six nine three. Sure, I didn't miss anyone. 860 965 We've got a couple people who just jumped on.
I apologize if I've already called this number 860-202-3693. Doug, this number just joined, so you might have to re-ask the question. Okay. Uh, so what we're asking for at this segment of the meeting is the attributes that the community feels will be important in the successor chief of police. So that can be educational, it can be experiential, it can be you know regional, Northeast, it doesn't matter in terms of where they may be coming from. Uh, it could be their style, their comfort of community engagement. It can be their communication style. Really just uh, the, 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 um, the analogy I'm providing is if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and create the perfect chief of police for Wethersfield, uh, Connecticut, what are the adjectives? What are the descriptors? How would that person, you know, what do they have in terms of bringing to the table for the position? So it's kind of an open-ended question that we use then to evaluate and develop as part of the brochure that will market the opportunity there will be um, the ideal candidate profile, if you will. Okay. And 860-402-8285. If you wish to speak, you can press star six. All right, I think that's all. There are a couple of people who are, looks like they're just going to be joining on in a few seconds. So if you just want Okay, to... what I can do, Gary, why don't, I, why don't I transition and have Larry and I talk a little bit about kind of what the search process looks like and the mechanics of it, because that's always a question that community re residents uh, want to get a feel for. So well, obviously- I do have one more oh. phone number, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. Zero, if I didn't call it 860-614-0759. I think you might have lost Larry too. No, he's still there. All right, go ahead. Okay, great. All right. Well, so let's transition to um, what the what the the search or recruitment process looks like. And it sounds like I've got a recruiter or a fellow recruiter out there in some fashion, one of the earlier callers as well. So um, as I say, it starts with what we're doing this week, and that's to talk to elected officials, appointed officials, community representatives, uh, department officials, things of that nature to get a comprehensive understanding of the position and the challenges and issues and the attributes you're, you're seeking in your successor chief. Um, once we finish that process, we will work with our team back with SGR and we'll develop a position profile brochure that will be a marketing piece that we will use in our networks, coupled with the various trade associations that we recommend uh, the town uh, authorized placements for ads for the position. Um, that being said, um, as we market this position, we will capture out of the traditional advertising venues, you'll get about on an average, about 15% of your candidates will come from that area. One of the things that SGR really prides itself in and why we think we're really strong and exceptional with regards to executive recruitment is a very strong network of candidates that have been in previous searches or are plugged into our network in some way, shape or form. And I say that because most candidates, uh, most communities we work for um, are also interested in what we call passive candidates. These are candidates that aren't necessarily in the marketplace, may not even be thinking about a job, but because of an outreach that we have to them through any number of mechanisms to talk a little bit about how that works, are going to hear about this opportunity. And as a result, may become interested, even though they weren't really thinking they were looking for another job. And those are what we call passive candidates in the business. And so um, that's an important element to raise because we find as we go back and look at our candidates that go through the searches, we track this effort and we find that about two thirds of the candidates that are identified by the communities we work for as semi-finalists um, have applied for the position because of something SGR has done to notify them about this opportunity. So obviously in that pool is a good group of passive candidates that aren't really thinking about the next job. And those are sometimes your best candidates because they're not anxious to necessarily relocate. But, and they can be interested because of the opportunity, the geographic location, whatever that may be, the challenges that are presented in the profile. Um, you know, obviously the motivations are something that, that we, we learn more about the candidates as we go deeper into the effort. 
But so I raise that in the sense that the first process after the after we complete the position profile brochure and have the, the, the town authorize us to launch the job, when we launch that process, we're basically advertising to the world, this is an opportunity for you. And our network is very strong. We also are very strong in social media outreaches. We have um, in our we have a number of people that are have signed up for individual job alerts. Um, and those are individuals that say, I'm interested in senior level police positions. Uh, most, I just looked at that last week. We have close to 10,000 people that have signed up for that list. So um, when, we re when we're ready to launch a job, those people are also getting those, those issues. But we have a number of other programs and emails that go out to a number of other individuals on a pro, a pro uh, kind of a proactive basis. Uh, on an annual or a weekly type basis. Every Tuesday, we have what's called our 10 and 10 uh, newsletter, and that goes out to close to 50,000 people. And that's 10 links of issues of topical interest to local governments. Um, I, as a former manager, I shared those links with a number of my department heads and departments and used those as conversations we'd have at staff meetings or at department staff meetings. But in that 50,000 outreach, that also identifies current searches and upcoming searches. So we're already starting to advertise this as an opportunity for future efforts. So that's how we start to generate some interest. Um, as, as we advertise that position, um, then Larry and I will be involved in in processing those candidates. So they come into our application. So we're going to see their cover letter. We're going to see their, their resume. Uh, there's a brief questionnaire we ask them to fill out at the time of the application. To just give us a better snapshot to make sure we've kind of got an initial, an initial perspective of, of what they're doing, where they're at, uh, the current position they're in, if they're currently employed or in transition, things of that nature, salary expectations, all that sort of effort, and some credential material. For example, do they have a bachelor's, do they have a master's, have they been involved in the FBI Academy or the Perf Academy or Senior Executive Institute, things of that nature. We'll develop that after we finish the, the profile work that we're doing this week. Um, and then what will happen is Larry and I will will triage those candidates. And so uh, I'm bringing the perspective as a city manager who's always had police officers and police departments in my operations and in, in the years in both large and smaller communities. Now, Larry's certainly going to bring as a subject matter expertise as a former law enforcement officer and certainly an executive and a chief and assistant chief. And we'll compare our notes. And Larry and I have done a number of searches together. So we're probably pretty much in sync in how we, we rate candidates. But there's times where he may rate a top tier candidate and I may be in a mid tier candidate or vice versa. And we'll talk through that effort and we'll, we'll come to some conclusion. And then what we'll do is we will present a process to whatever, we're still working through this about what that search committee may be, whether that's a totally internal or a combination of, of different people being involved in, in hearing the presentation of the candidate pool and the triage. And we'll, we'll provide our perspective as, as the town's recruiters about, you know, these are the candidates we think meet or exceed what you said you're looking for. These are candidates we think are largely checking off those boxes and potentially could be a very strong candidate but we're quite frankly, may not have all the information about them. We will also have a variety of candidates that have applied that have either no credentials, no academic, or they have significant issues that might be a challenge for them to be what I would say a viable candidate for consideration for a position such as a chief of police. Um, and as a result of that, we will then work with a selection committee process, whatever the town decides who we're working with, and they will typically select somewhere around between eight to 12 folks that they're interested in learning more about. So I'm gonna step back and say, um, in order to do a search process, it's like a funnel, if you can envision a, an analogy. And at the front end of the search process is the top of the funnel. So we're gonna know a little about a lot of people who are interested in this position who have applied. And Larry and I will do some initial due diligence and background work on that, but we don't wanna invest all the time and energy because at that point, we don't know whether they're gonna be selected by the town to be a semi-finalist, let alone a finalist. So as we go through that next step and after the town process goes and we presented those candidates, um, they'll select you know, typically between eight to 12, wherever the natural break will be. And those will be considered semi-finalists. So we'll release those folks that were not selected and those folks that are going in as semi-finalists, they, they start kind of an additional level of, of work that is required. So typically we develop a questionnaire that is around 20 or 25 questions. Um, where it's a written response, and then we're going to ask them to talk about the operations they're overseeing, the number of people they are involved with, the size of budgets they're involved with, management philosophy type questions. We're always going to ask, you know, why did they left their previous positions or, you know, it's promotion or whatever the reason may be. We always ask candidates to disclose anything in their background that would be of concern potentially for a, uh, a new employer. 
Um, we're going to ask them about uh, questions that they may have for the for the town and the department. Uh, but we will also sprinkle in a series of questions in that questionnaire that ask the candidates to respond in writing about some of the challenges and issues that we'll be identifying that'll be identified in the, bro in the profile. So that the town can start to get a feel about what their background, each of the candidates background and how they would approach it, approach some of those challenges and opportunities and issues. And they'll link their experience with their kind of forward thinking that if selected, this is kind of the process I would use to address that. And here's, you know, kind of that, that mindset. Um, in addition to that, our semifinalists typically are involved in answering uh, pre-recorded video interview questions. We typically do three or four of those. Um, it is not a two-way interview process, but it is allows a candidate to really respond to a question. Those are more generally higher level. Um, you know, what is it about the position that interests you personally and professionally, or why do you think it's a good fit? Now, we typically ask about their management style, their guiding values. Uh, I always ask questions in those video interviews about things that isn't, aren't necessarily reflected on your resume. I'm trying to learn a little bit more about them. And then um, we also, for the semifinalists, we start in addition, Larry and I will certainly do some basic Googling and background work. And, and we've got an eye for kind of challenges that may be something we need to unpack with a candidate before the triage process. But um, we will also at the semifinalist level start to do what's called a, a, a level one um, media, a stage one media assessment. And that's a, a LexisNexis database of newspapers and, and articles and things of that nature that will, uh, those candidates' names will pop up whenever they've been kind of involved in recent years, typically anywhere between three to six or seven years act. And so in addition to asking the candidate about their background and issues, we're starting to get some more, a little more deeper dive than just a, a kind of a basic Google search that Larry and I would be involved in at the front end. Um, and then we provide the, uh, the semifinalist cover letters, resumes, uh, questionnaire responses, and the links to the pre-recorded video interviews. And we typically give the town, you know, a week to 10 days to kind of work themselves through that process and, and review that. And then Larry and I would be meeting with that committee or whatever the selection group is um, to kind of talk about those candidates. Uh, and we help facilitate a conversation about which ones they like, which ones they don't like. And, you know, and, and Larry and I will add our perspective as the recruiters as to where we think strengths or weaknesses may be on the various candidates. And just give a sense, typically, uh, if this profile, if this process goes like most, um, there's going to be uh, two or three candidates that, that everybody likes and two or three candidates that nobody likes. And there's a lot of discussion about the ones in the middle. And so we really just help facilitate that conversation and allow the selection committee to be involved in what they thought were strengths or weaknesses or concerns and get a chance to hear each other. And then Larry and I normally just listen in on that. And then if there's something that we think is important that hasn't been raised, we'll, we'll chime in on that or give our insight about that to help it. But the town is ultimately the one that makes the selection at the semifinalist level and then again at the finalist level. So those eight to 12 will go through that process. We will work with the, the selection committee to, uh, to help uh, um, get that narrowed down. And that's typically a smaller group. There's normally about three to five folks that the community, uh, the town is interested in bringing in for personal interviews. Um, the work doesn't stop for those candidates at that point. It's a pretty heavy lift to go through an SGR search. Uh, those candidates typically are going to be asked to develop what we call a first year game plan. And that's each candidate's re written response as to if they're appointed as the chief of police, what are they going to do in their first 30, 60, 90, 180 days in their balance of their first year? And I know that may sound kind of everybody will do the same. Literally, Larry and I've seen hundreds of these. And everyone approaches that differently, which also gives you some normative insights about how people look at the perspective of their job and how they're going to get acclimated to the community and to the department and the challenges that they're going to be facing. And so that gives some additional insights that uh, helps out for our perspective. Uh, we'll work with the community to work through the interview process, whether that is a um, is a certainly a probably involving uh, interviews and panel interviews of administrative people. Perhaps we normally have a senior staff process, uh, the command structure and, and within the department. Um, clearly, the department personnel are going to be anxious to meet your chief's candidates as much as the chief candidates are going to be anxious to meet the department. So we facilitate that type of effort. We normally incorporate a public meet and greet um, as well as a department meet and greet so that people have a chance to mingle and, and engage with the candidates and we help facilitate that, provide backgrounds and bios of those candidates uh, so that you've got a sense of that and encourage you to reach out to the decision makers, be the elected officials, appointed officials or others involved in that. 
Um, we also are clearly um, the nature, both of us, with Larry and myself coming uh, from a public sector background, we don't want to get caught off guard. So at this, at the finalist level, uh, we will do uh, criminal history credit, background, any legal efforts, verification of employment, verification of educational efforts, you know, all that stuff will be out there, any current or pending liens, all that it will be done on your finalist. Um, we will also do what's called a much more detailed stage two media search. We have a, actually people on our staff that spend literally hours uh, going through everything that's possibly can be found uh, through a deep dive of, of social media sites, public uh, records information, things of that nature, wherever these candidates have, have worked as an adult. So we can capture that. We provide all that information uh, to the town so that they have a chance to see it. And, and that can be overwhelming for a position. If someone is in police chief, you may have two to 300 pages worth of that material. And so there's a lot there, but we also flag anything that might be a findings. And you also see the, the candidates' names are highlighted. So if it's just a report of an incident or a budget presentation or whatever that would be, you can quickly kind of get a snapshot. But it will also give you a sense of how your candidates have handled themselves in a public media kind of exposure, whether it be social media, print media, television stories, radio, whatever the case would be. So that's part of it as well. Uh, we clearly are involved in the reference checks and the process so that uh, our goal is to make sure that as you go through this process, wherever the final can is selected, that you know everything about them and they're ready to go. And then it's just a matter of negotiating the final package and getting them to move forward. So it's helpful to kind of just kind of describe that's what we bring to the table. Um, clearly, we're at the front end of this process, so I can't tell you exactly what the details of that selection process will look like at the semifinalist level and then again at the finalist level. Uh, Gary and I and, and, the, and the administration and the council will get a chance to kind of talk through what your expectations would be. But typically for a police chief, it's going to involve a series of panel interviews, a series of meet and greets. Um, and, you know, we'll figure that process. So I'll tell you, stay tuned as, as that becomes clear. We'll identify that because, as I say, this is a public position. It's a high profile position. Uh, and my experience is that uh, most communities want to reach out and, and get to know these candidates and weigh in in some way, shape or form to the decision makers about their thoughts of, about strengths or concerns or issues involved there. So I'll stop there for a second. Larry, do you want to jump in? Uh, uh, if there's anything you'd like to add about that effort or any insights you have, because obviously you and I have been doing this, uh, you know, both collectively and individually on other searches. Uh, well, Doug, you did an excellent job of giving an overview. Um, and every time I thought of something I was going to add, then you went, then you covered it too. So I don't, I don't have too much to add. I, I will say that, uh, that, going through this process uh, early on as we're doing now is as, as an opportunity for uh, Doug and I to get to know the community much better as well. And so that helps us start understanding more about how we will help uh, the decision makers uh, funnel this process and, and the way we will design the questions and things of that nature to make sure we're highlighting what it is that the community is actually looking for. And uh, even as I'm listening to conversation tonight and some of the, the, some of the comments, I'm already starting to think of some of the uh, things that we can use to do that. And I've also thought of some people that I want to contact and make sure they're aware of this position. So it's helpful for us to just start learning uh, more about what it takes to be successful there. So thank you. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, to that, to the point that Larry is emphasizing, our, our SGR's philosophy on executive recruitment is whoever's appointed in this position is going to have to successfully navigate kind of three different landscapes. And um, one of those is clearly the department itself. Uh, every department has its culture, its DNA, its issues. And whoever comes in is going to have to be able to kind of understand and work through that process and, and, and work with their existing team members and the team members that will be joining the organization, you know, going forward. Um, the second element of that is the administration, uh, and then and that the administration being not only Gary's office, the city as town manager, but also other department heads and other and the elected officials on the town council. That's kind of a separate kind of stakeholder interest group, and that's why we're meeting with the elected officials and meeting with department heads and meeting with the folks not just within the department but also within the the, the town administration and, and elected officials as a whole. And the third element is the part of what we're talking about tonight is the community. This is a very highly visible public position and there's expectations. Everyone kind of owns the chief in some way, shape or form because of the nature of the position. And so um, Larry hit on the head. Part of what we're doing here is to understand what that landscape looks like so that we, as we're evaluating candidates, talking to prospective candidates and, and helping the town go through this process, 
we can add insights as professional recruiters and people that have been in the local government arena for a long time um, to just add some additional flavor and insight as to where we think candidates stand and strengths or weaknesses or potential blind spots uh, that we might be able to identify just because of our background and training as well. So that's kind of the, the process there. Um, and then why don't I to kind of go to the next step as well, and then Gary, or Gary you can open it up if there's questions about that as well. Um, I also want to let you know, because of the nature of this, um, we're working with Gary and the administration to, uh, they are proposing to put out a community survey um, that will kind of extend this conversation out for those who may not want to, to chime in or, or, or talk or be seen tonight. Uh, really another opportunity for folks to weigh in on the types of questions we're raising this evening and the background and the attributes and just some of the things that you think are critical issues that uh, the next chief and the administration are going to have to get their arms around. And so there's another opportunity for that. And we'll work with Gary and they'll administer that process and we'll take the results of that, that information that comes back. And that will certainly be part of the lens in which um, uh, Larry and I will use and the process in helping to evaluate the candidates as they go deeper into the search process. So with that, I think I'll stop again. And Gary, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, that's a lot of information and we're welcome to address any questions or comments that might come forward. I'm going to do it a little differently than I have been simply because calling out the phone number or the name hasn't necessarily worked out well. And I'm sure you guys don't want to listen to me just calling out names and numbers. So um, it's going to be somewhat of a hodgepodge. I'll say for those of you who are on the video call, if you can um, just g either give a reaction or raise your hands. If you're familiar enough with Zoom, you kind of just scroll down to that bottom bar. You'll get a pop up and you can just click a reaction. Um, and, uh, uh, and I will pick on you from there. For anyone who is currently on the phone that wishes to speak, um, I'm gonna take the risk of saying, if you unmute yourself, um, then, um, and actually I see a hand up, so we'll let, I'll call them in a second, but if you unmute yourself, I'll kind of just take note and um, call on you when we get to, uh, when we get through the name. So again, just kind of unmute yourself you don't have to speak, but just leave it on unmute and we'll go from there. So the first hand that I see up is, um, I see Cindy Zerbless. So if you'd like to speak, you can unmute yourself and speak. If you're calling in, just pre if it's a, oh, where'd you go? I lost her. Lost her. Okay. Um, anyone else who would like to speak? You can either unmute yourself, raise your hand, or use a reaction emoji. Again, last call, you can press star six to unmute yourself or just hit a reaction mode emoji and uh, we'll let you in. Hold on, looks like Cindy's coming back online. Go ahead, Deb. Um, can you just say a little bit about um, how you're going to reach out to everybody in town with the, um, questionnaire or the survey that you mentioned, Doug? Uh, sure, I'll set the table and then I'm gonna turn it over to Gary because they're, Gary, the town's gonna to be actually the one administering the survey. So what um, Larry and I are starting, we've developed some questions that we think would be appropriate to ask. And then um, the town's going to actually, I don't know if they're using SurveyMonkey or, you know, some device to go forward. So we're going to be helping in the input of what the survey looks like, and then the town's going to administer it. So Gary, this is probably one you're better asked to address in terms of how that's administered at your end. Yep. Um, we're not sure of the survey system that we're going to use just yet. We want to make sure that there's protections in there, but ultimately um, we would create a, a link through the town website, town Facebook page, um, we'll blast, we'll find different avenues to blast it out um, so that residents have the opportunity through multiple venues to respond. Will we just be sure that, that people who don't have internet access or acumen um, will still be able to get a hold of it? 
Yeah, I'll have to think about that. And in, uh, in a pre-COVID day, I would probably set something up at the library and other um, other public buildings so that people could uh, could um, access it and fill it out and drop it in. Um, I'll have to think a little bit about that. The library is back and open. Town Hall is is available. Um, so yeah, we'd probably have some paper copies available as well. Thank you. Yep, that's a great idea. And just as a as a follow up on that point, um, both Larry and I have found these community surveys to add some additional opportunity for community feedback. And, and to that point, obviously, the last one that I did was pre COVID where we did a survey for a police chief. Uh, but yes, that was the same point, Gary, that uh, they put in some libraries and some other, you know, community center areas and allow a drop box that had a deadline that things had to be responded to. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, obviously, we're in a different world with COVID now than we were then. So the changes in guidelines and everything will be able to accommodate something. Sure. All right. And um, back to, it looked like Cindy had her hand up. So Cindy, if you're able to speak, go ahead. Sorry about that. I disconnected myself. I'm, I'm actually driving. Should I be saying that while we're looking at a police chief? Oh, um, that's <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> I'm doing it hands-free. I'm doing it hands-free. I, I actually kind of have a question, you know, about the consultants that are going to be working on this hiring. I'm just curious because I did a little bit of, uh, I guess I call it recon work on you guys, and mm -hmm. and I didn't see where you hired a, a lot of police chiefs. I see a lot of um, government city type jobs that you've done hiring for. I'm just curious how many police chiefs that you guys have worked on in the past and what's the success rate of some of these police chiefs? So I will, I'll answer that at the high level first. Yes, we do a lot of police chief searches. It is certainly one of our main, as I said, you may or may not have heard, we've got close to 10,000 people that are on our list that want to get advanced notification. So that gives you some indication that we are, we are definitely involved in law enforcement searches. Uh, I've probably done half a dozen in my five or five and a half years going on six years with uh, SGR. Larry exclusively works in the law enforcement arena, so I'm going to let him talk about it. He can certainly identify a number of the searches he's been involved with, um, and I can certainly do the same as well. So, Larry, you want to just kind of, it, it is certainly something that is a regular recruitment activity for us. So, you may have just looked at the most recent ones, but if we go back, um, we, we can certainly provide the town. I think we may have probably did earlier uh, all the different law enforcement activity searches we've been involved with uh, since, our, uh, since our founding. And I, and I apologize if you talked about that earlier. Not, not a problem. Larry, you just want to talk about maybe some of the searches you've been involved with and in, in you know, the last couple of years as well. I can chime in after that as well. Sure, Doug. And uh, as you indicated, uh, uh, police chief searches are all that I do. That's my passion. That's what I care about. Uh, it, as we already discussed, it's, uh, it is a critical role. It always has been, but it's certainly being ratcheted up over the last several years. Uh, and uh, and I'm gonna have to go off the top of my head. I've, uh, I, I, re I retired from Irving 2016, so I've been doing this exclusively since then. That's probably been about 20 or more searches in that time uh, span. Um, uh, largest community I've done uh, was Fort Worth. Uh, police chief search was was almost a, a million uh, in population, um, and the smallest I've done was a community of about 15,000, and uh, everything in between. Um, the, uh, so far, uh, highly successful. Uh, every every uh, community has been um, you know, satisfied with the process and satisfied with with their selection. Uh, and uh, you know, as we discussed earlier, we we certainly work to make this as uh, customized uh, and and as exclusive for the community and what the community needs as as we can. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. It, well, I guess, too, like, when I say success, I mean, you know, if, if there was an issue with, with break-ins there and things like that, was that, you know, did you did, did you get feedback from the towns that, you know, yeah, that got taken care of and, and, and the residents are happy in that kind of a way? Not that sure. the person is still there. I, I guess I should have kind of been clear when I was asking. So, 
Yeah, let me let me respond to that. Fair question. Um, we, as I say, we take what we do very seriously. We know we're working on behalf of our clients across the country. So all of our finalists receive a survey at the end of the process. Um, so we get feedback from the candidates, and all of our clients also receive surveys. So we get a sense of what worked or any issues and feedback. We go forward. Uh, what I would tell you is that um, SDR has skin in the game in this effort. Our for a full service search like we're doing here that if a candidate leaves for whatever reason, after they've successfully gone through all the stages of the process and the town has, has hired them, if they leave for whatever reason within 18 months after that hire, we're back and we redo the search without a professional fee. So it's not that we don't love you and we don't wanna come back and help you, um, but we really wanna come back and help you do redo a search. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, I've been at this with SGR now on a full-time basis for uh, getting close to six years. I've only, the one search I redid because a candidate unfortunately passed away. Uh, one search I inherited from another recruiter at the 11th hour and, and we had to redo it. But that's been the only two out of 100 plus searches that I've been involved with personally. I've never had a police chief search not land and be successful. Um, and as I say, uh, most of the time, if we do our homework at the front end and do all the work that we're talking about tonight and we understand those three kind of bucket areas that I described that the candidates have to navigate in, uh, those candidates will be a good fit, um, you know, but things change and circumstances change and all that. We're here to stand behind it. So it's not just us saying hire them. Uh, you ultimately make that decision. But if they go through that process, we stand behind it with a guarantee. And um, so our experience is we and, and as part of that, we're always getting feedback from our clients and feedback from our candidates, uh, because those are the groups that we interface with regularly about, you know, uh, how we change our processes. And we are constantly in looking at self-improvement. So every search we do is a little bit different, but we certainly bring a perspective from being a major recruiter to say, if you want to do it this way, here's how we can help you structure it to be the most effective. But many of our clients, similar to what we're here tonight, uh, they've been satisfied with our work. Uh, and they hire us to do work uh, for other searches. As I said I was involved in, in the process when Gary was recruited. And uh, that's a good number of our business, our repeat clients uh, asking us to do other searches for other positions. And, and just out of curiosity, and I, I, I promise it'll probably be my, hopefully my last question. And again, I apologize if you talked about any of this because I did sign on late. Um, in, a, in a town like ours, it's small. You know, we're not a big town. We're not Dallas, Fort Worth, where where you might bring in a, you know, an outsider. Like, how often do you ever look at inside, um, you know, officers that are already on the inside to fill a position like this, or or is that really not something that you guys look at? Because um, yeah, I, sure. I personally, as a as a community member, I really think that we need a um, police chief that knows the town and knows who the residents are because we have a huge uh, problem in this town where we have people coming in, you know, you know, breaking into our cars every night and it's, it's getting old. And, and, you know, you want officers out on the streets that know, know the community and, and a police chief that knows the community. Sure. Good, good question as well. So when we advertise, uh, we're, we've been asked to, to be involved in a national search. And so we'll, we'll recommend, you know, how that process looks and feels like. But in any number of searches, and I'm, Larry can chime in on this as well, in many cases, we have internal candidates. And uh, those internal candidates get vetted out and evaluated and participate in all the process, just like a, an external candidate would be. Um, let me give you a little bit of pers perspective. As I said, I've been in city management for 35 years before I moved into the consulting arena. And uh, with two exceptions in that 35 years of experience, uh, did I hire a department head directly and promoted a department head up directly. Two different communities, but they were clearly ready for the position. The organization was ripe for their leadership and they were ready to hit the ground running. In all the other department head positions I've ever recruited for, now this is me as a city manager before I was with SGR, I always advertised nationally. And the reason I did that is I viewed it as a win-win scenario. Uh, in many of those cases, I had internal candidates or maybe an assistant department head or assistant position or you know, looking to move into a different department as a, a promotion for like an assistant manager or something like that. And not by happenstance, but literally by just the way it shook out, is that literally in all those searches I've done over those years as a manager, almost about half of them were I ended up promoting the internal candidate. And obviously that meant the other half of the time I promoted or I hired someone from outside. And why I viewed that as a win-win is that 
if a candidate applies for the position as an internal candidate, they competed against the best of the best uh, on a national format. And if they got the job, they had an extra boost, if you will. They weren't appointed just because they were an internal candidate. They earned the spot and that they demonstrated that they were the best candidate that we felt we needed at that given time or organization. So in that regard, it helped the candidate that was promoted upward because they got they, they knew they, they earned the job. It wasn't just simply a promotion. On the flip side, for those other half of the jobs when I promoted or hired people from outside the organization, what that meant it was is that at that given time in the organization's history and the challenges we we're facing and who the previous manager or department head was versus where I thought the next future was going to be, it was a win-win for the organization as well, because at that point we did hire who I felt was the best person for the job. And maybe if there was an internal candidate that was still emerging and developing professionally, they weren't necessarily quite ready for the position at that point of their juncture. That was a win for us as an organization because that individual got a chance to be mentored by whoever was hired as the department head for one, two, three, five years, whatever the case would be. And in some cases that worked where um, that, that person we hired moved on at, down the road to a different position. And then there was an opportunity for that individual who wasn't quite ready initially, who maybe is subsequently promoted to the position within the organization. But also from a professional development standpoint, one of the reasons I'm with SGR now is I really believe in the profession and how do we help the next generation. In some cases, that candidate has developed and professionally ready for the next job. And if there wasn't an opportunity in my organization, we've helped that candidate advance and they were a chief or a department head in another organization. And we've helped them further their career, it may not been with our position. And we've you know, obviously helped the profession as a whole and helped other communities in that regard. So I viewed it as a win-win scenario. But in response to your question, we may very well have internal candidates. If they are selected as a semi-finalist or finalist, they'll be treated just like every other candidate. And at the end of the day, hopefully the strongest candidate will be selected by the town based on all those factors. So hopefully that gives you a perspective on that. Yes, thank you. All right, anyone else? If you're on the phone, if you wanna hit star six, I'll note to see if you turn the microphone off and call on you. Or if anyone wants to make a comment, they can start speaking and they'll go from there. All right, I think that's it for that component. Doug? Uh, great. Well, thank you so much. As I say, we appreciate everybody's time. And even those that were just listening in to learn more about the process, hopefully we've enlightened you a little bit about what this is all about, and what we're doing, and how we're trying to help the community go through this recruitment. Um, I will tell you, stay tuned. I know Gary will have additional information out there for those that may want to chime in on a, on a survey. Uh, so look for that information going forward. And then what I also say is, as we get a better feel for what the actual recruitment process and the selection process looks like, I would assume that there will be some public engagement process at the end, whether that's a meet and greet virtually in person. We don't know what the landscape's going to look like with COVID you know, later in the year. Uh, but what I'll tell you, stay tuned. Um, you know, the fact that there's 20 plus people that plugged in tonight mean you're interested in this position and understanding what's all about. And so what I encourage you to say is uh, stay plugged into it. And at the end of the process, especially as a finalist or in town, uh, there's, there'll be an opportunity to kind of weigh in and provide it. And maybe we'll have a chance to meet each other face to face as opposed to virtually or by the phone. So thank you so much for the time tonight. And um, Larry, anything you want to add before I turn it back over to Gary to close? I uh, think you've said it, Doug. I appreciate the opportunity. I enjoyed uh, listening to everyone. Um, I know Doug and, and, and I, our attention, intention is to make this a very hard decision on the decision makers because they have so many good candidates to choose from. And so uh, you have our commitment to give our best effort to make that happen. Excellent. Great. Okay, Gary, it's, it's, your, it's your, your show. <laughs> yeah, I don't have much of a closing statement uh, other than I really appreciate the individuals that were able to come in, even whether or not you were just listening or whether or not you added uh, great questions or commentary to the, uh, to the dialogue. I, I greatly appreciate people being here. Um, I know Doug did a pretty detailed explanation of what the next process will be. Uh, our intent is to keep the public informed as we move through that process. And uh, I'm looking forward to next steps.
So uh, thank that's you all guys. I have. Thank you all. Thank you, folks. Have a good evening. Thank you.